The Strange But True stories featured on this podcast contain details some people may find unsettling. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Chaya Samuel and things are about to get weird. Hello there, welcome to episode 10 of Things Are About To Get Weird. We've made it to double digits and I really am so thrilled to have you all here with me for the ride. So a big thank you to each and every one of you for your incredible support so far. I hope you're all looking forward to Halloween as much as I am. Well, if you're anything like me, you've probably been excited since about the 1st of September. But in any case, with this episode being the first small milestone I've reached, and with Halloween being just around the corner, I thought it was the perfect time to do something a little bit special. In a few of the previous episodes, I've alluded a couple of times to the fact that I am a believer in the paranormal. I grew up being obsessed with ghost stories, spooky films, anything to do with spirits and anything otherworldly. In the very first episode of this podcast, I mentioned that I spent a lot of time in North Wales during my childhood, and I think that really contributed towards this fascination. My grandparents had a caravan near Conwy, and if you've never been there, it's an ancient town with this amazing castle, which was built around 1283. It's got a lot of little shops which have a mystic and spiritual edge to them, and the whole town has this amazing medieval feel to it. It really is one of my favourite places in the whole world. Anyway, as kids, we spent what felt like every school holiday at the caravan, and it was the best. I loved it so much. Each time we were in the town of Conwy itself around the evening time, my sister and I would beg my mum or my grandparents to go on this ghost walk that operated around the early evening. I'm sure that we would meet the host, who was always dressed in a very witchy kind of outfit, around this well, and we'd go from there. We went on this tour enough time so that I knew all of the stories by heart, and I can still remember pretty much all of them today. It was amazing. I'm fairly sure they sold. It was a very small sort of home printed booklet, which had all the stories in. So once we'd been on the tour, we'd then go back and we'd read them all again, and they really stuck in our minds. Anyway, all of this is to say that all things paranormal have fascinated me my whole life and leads to the topic of today's episode, which is my own paranormal experiences. Before I start, I did want to say that I completely appreciate that not everyone believes in ghosts or spirits or anything paranormal, and that is absolutely 100% fine. I don't judge anyone who thinks this is all a load of rubbish or easily explainable. And I've actually had some amazing conversations with non-believers over the years when I've told them my stories. I think it's super compelling to get every perspective. So please do take this as you like. If you're a believer like me, then I hope you find my stories interesting. And if you're not, and there's no way you'll be convinced, then these encounters might still be entertaining to you at least. Let's start with the very first paranormal experience I had when I was around the age of 10. So around the year 2000, after having previously lived in Greater Manchester in Cheshire all my life, I moved to a tiny village called Upton in the north of Lincolnshire. If you're not from the UK or you're not familiar with Lincolnshire, it's a huge county on the east side of the country. It's so big that it borders South Yorkshire and the East Riding of Yorkshire to the north, but the south of the county actually borders places like Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. But despite it being very large, it's very much an agricultural county. It was obviously a huge change going from living in busy towns not far from the city of Manchester to what is, and I say this in the most loving way possible, the absolute middle of nowhere. In 2011, the estimated population of Upton was around 450 people, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were even fewer people there back in the year 2000. Even though we only lived there for a couple of years, it was a very formative time, and looking back, it was actually a really fun part of my childhood. At the weekends, my sister and I would leave the house straight after breakfast and be out with our friends, riding our bikes until tea time. It always felt very safe, and we made some great friends, and as an adult, I feel grateful that we got that time to just be kids. We were always out exploring and having fun in the fresh air without technology or screens being involved, and 
I find that pretty special to be able to look back on now. One thing we'd do is walk around the village church's graveyard a lot and we'd invent little quests and play tricks on each other pretending we were getting messages from the graves. And I remember actually being quite attached to the grave of a lady who had died on my birthday but years before I was actually born. I remember that her name was Elsie and I'd often leave little trinkets or flowers I'd picked on her grave. This isn't directly related to the stories that I'm going to be telling you today but I think it illustrates that I've always been a little weird. But, you know, the good kind of weird. You may disagree, but anyway. The village of Upton has ancient origins. In fact, the church I just mentioned was originally built around the 11th century and then largely rebuilt during the 13th century. You can definitely feel the history of the place and even as a kid I felt very tuned in to just how old the village was. Now between Upton and the next village which is called Heapham there's a place called Sturgate Airfield. It's a former Royal Air Force station which was used during World War II and for several years after the war it became a base for the United States Air Force. I promise this is relevant as even though it's now largely disused people in the village would often say that the airfield had left a somewhat paranormal legacy. We'd hear stories about the village being haunted by the souls of RAF pilots who lost their lives in the war, and even by American military personnel who had passed away while stationed at Sturgate. I'm sure we were absolutely not meant to be doing this, but some of the days when we'd go off on our bikes, we would ride around parts of the disused airfield, and it did have a really eerie feel to it. I vividly remember a babysitter who lived on our road telling my sister and I that the land our houses were built on was haunted, as were all the fields around us, and that he himself had seen an apparition in one of the large fields closest to us. But when he was telling us this, little did he know that I'd recently had an encounter all of my own. One night, I was in bed trying to fall asleep, probably after staying up a little bit too late reading a book, as was the case most nights. My bed was positioned with the headboard against the back wall and to the left I had a full length oval shaped mirror which was on a wooden frame. It was positioned at an angle a few steps away from the foot of my bed and as I always slept with my door open I could actually see out onto the landing in the reflection of the angled mirror from my bed. I really liked this setup as my sister's room was right next to mine and if I was woken up by a sound in the night I could always quickly see through the reflection in the mirror that it was just my sister going to get a drink or something and reassure myself it wasn't anything to be concerned about. So on this night I was lying lying in bed looking out onto the landing through the mirror. The landing wasn't in total darkness, there was definitely a light on somewhere and I could see fairly well all the way down to the door at the end of the corridor. Out of nowhere as I was looking directly at that far door on the landing, I saw a white figure glide from the door along the landing towards my room, disappearing somewhere around the middle of the corridor. When I tell you, I completely froze. It's no exaggeration. I couldn't move a muscle and there was no way that I could have screamed or ran from my room. I remember being paralyzed, not with fear, but because I was so sure of what I'd seen, it was so clear to me that it was more a realization that there was a ghost in our house and I'd seen it with my own eyes. I must have fallen asleep at some point that night because the next morning, I remember my mum waking me up to get ready for school. Now, I've always been a very chatty person, which I'm sure is something that will come as a surprise to no one, and my mum must have recognised that something wasn't quite right that morning. From what I can recall, I think I was making my bed and she was getting my school uniform out of my wardrobe and she asked me if everything was okay. My mum is one of those people that you cannot hide anything from. She can read people like a book. I knew there was no way that I could lie to her, so I just said, I think I saw a ghost on the landing last night. I remember her looking at me quite seriously before her demeanour completely changed and she totally brushed it off and made it all seem very light-hearted, reassuring me that I was probably just dreaming or tired and that it was nothing to worry about. It had freaked me out so severely the night before that I was relieved by her reaction and whilst I definitely mentioned it to my friends at school that day, I generally tried to forget about it. 
At night, I would go to sleep facing the wall instead of looking into the mirror onto the landing, and I just kept telling myself that there was nothing to be scared of. Flash forward to around 2003, we'd moved back to Cheshire and we were closer to loved ones again, which was amazing. And one afternoon or early evening, we were having a little family get together at our new house. At the time, the TV show Most Haunted was huge. If you're not familiar with it, it's a paranormal investigation reality programme hosted by the wonderful Yvette Fielding, who I love, and the show really became this cult classic. I think everyone in my family watched it, and my uncle Alan and I would often discuss the episodes amongst other paranormal cases we'd heard about. On this day, I was sat with several close family members in our new house, and we were discussing Most Haunted. And after a while, I turned to my mum and said, remember when I told you about the ghost I saw when we lived in Upton? The room fell silent. My mum hesitated before saying something along the lines of, Well, I guess I can tell you this now as we don't live in that house anymore, but you weren't the only one to see the ghost. As it turns out, my stepdad, who is the person in my life I thought least likely to ever even entertain the notion of the supernatural, he's very, very matter of fact, but he had also seen the same spirit. He'd seen it sweep across the half landing platform, which was only a few steps down from where I'd seen it, and our descriptions of it were pretty much identical. It was this white figure that seemed to glide. The only thing is, neither of us knew the other had had this experience. We'd both told my mum, but she'd kept it to herself, so that explained her somewhat strange reaction when I first told her about my encounter. So as we're all having a moment about this wild turn of events, my uncle then proceeds to tell us that he also saw the same ghost. The room at the end of the landing nearest to where I saw the figure was the guest bedroom and when him and my auntie would come and visit, that's the room that they'd stay in. He had seen the ghost near the doorway during one of their visits and hadn't told any of us until that moment. For me, even though I'd always known that what I'd seen was real, this was just the most unbelievable confirmation and when I've told people this story in the past, it's really made even some of my most sceptical friends think twice. If all of that wasn't enough, these weren't the only strange experiences my family had at that house. My sister told us that she'd headed into the bathroom in the middle of the night and been greeted by this pull chain that switched on the light already swinging. There was no breeze, no window open, and at the bottom of this chain, it wasn't just one of those small, light plastic things. It was this heavy, wooden, sort of oval-shaped pendant. There's absolutely no reason it should have been swinging of its own accord, and that must have been very unsettling in itself. Both my mum and my grandma had bizarre experiences in the garden too. Remember I said there were fields around the house that our babysitter had seen a ghostly apparition in? Those fields were right next to our back garden, and whilst my mum and grandma didn't see anything as such, they had some very strange moments. One day, my mum was sitting out in the garden on a chair reading a magazine. Suddenly, she felt this huge force of energy swoop towards her right up to her face, and it jolted her backwards. She immediately stood up and just knew she had to get inside. It was just so strong, and she felt like she had to get out of the garden. She also had a similar but less powerful experience in the kitchen, which was right next to the garden too, and definitely felt the spirit energy that clearly occupied the land. Similarly, my grandma was out in the garden during a visit with our lovely little West Highland Terrier, Poppy, and from nowhere she felt a dark cloud of energy knock her back too. Poppy definitely picked up on it too. I mentioned in my episode about the Overton Bridge that I really do believe that dogs are very sensitive and very in tune with things that are perhaps paranormal or supernatural. We recently had another family get together where I was asking about these experiences ahead of recording this episode. The consensus was that the spirit that we all encountered probably had some link to RAF Sturgate. Personally, whilst I think that is a real possibility, The whole village is so ancient that maybe it goes back a lot further than that. I guess we'll never know, but it's something that I think about often. 
So after these revelations from my family, I definitely felt far less isolated in knowing that I'd had this paranormal encounter. When I first met my now husband back in 2008, I remember telling him about what had happened and I got the feeling that he was pretty skeptical, which is totally understandable. But that was about to change somewhat. This leads me on to my second paranormal experience, which in truth is more of my husband's experience, but I was very much there and I witnessed the effects of it. Allow me to explain. In the summer of 2009, we decided to take our very first holiday together, but being just 18 and 19 years old at the time, we didn't have enough money saved up from our part-time jobs to go abroad, so we decided to do a half camping, half bed and breakfast trip to North Wales. In hindsight, this is hilarious, as my husband is the least camping kind of guy I've ever met in my life, but I was up for it and he was a good sport, so we made all the arrangements. We bought the tent, we bought the camping stove, we borrowed someone's blow up air mattress thing and we set off for North Wales. From memory, the plan was to camp for three nights and then have one night in a bed and breakfast before heading home. We chose a place called Shell Island to camp, which is right on the coast and it lies within the Snowdonia National Park. It's actually a peninsula rather than a real island, but it's very pretty and we were really excited for our first girlfriend-boyfriend holiday together. When we first arrived, the weather was pretty nice and I remember us having a little barbecue and enjoying the sunshine. But that night and the next day and I think the next night, the weather was horrendous. I'm talking crazy strong winds, relentless rain and a massive temperature drop. We decided camping wasn't really for us and we called the bed and breakfast in nearby Harlech to see if we could stay a night early. They had a vacancy which we were very excited about, so we packed up our tent and we headed to the town. The lady who owned the B&B was lovely. I remember the family had this cute older dog and we felt really welcomed by her. Once we'd been shown to our room, I remember arguing about who was going to have the first hot shower after being rained on and freezing for the past 36 hours or so. But once we'd both warmed up and showered and we were a lot happier, we headed back out to visit Harlech Castle, which is incredible, and probably had tea at a pub before settling in for the night at the B&B. One thing we'd noticed is that our room looked out onto a church and a graveyard, but being a spooky girl at heart, it didn't bother me. And in fact, my husband's childhood home had also been next to a graveyard, so it didn't bother him either. The room had these full length, super heavy, proper velvet curtains, which covered the window, which looked out onto the graveyard. And it added this super cozy feel to the room. On the first night that we were there, I did my usual routine before bed, which of course included plugging in my phone to charge. I clearly remember checking that it was charging okay, just in case the plug socket wasn't working for some reason, and everything looked fine. We went to sleep and I had one of the best sleeps I've ever had, probably due to the fact that it was one, a real bed and not a sleeping bag, and two, we were warm and in a proper house rather than a flimsy tent. My husband slept really well too. Honestly, I think we were so tired from having next to no sleep the previous two nights that we pretty much passed out. When we woke up the next morning, I went to unplug my phone charger and saw that it was turned off at the wall. If you're not from the UK, here we don't just plug a cable into a socket and it automatically works. We have additional on off switches on pretty much every standard plug socket and an appliance won't turn on unless you also flick the switch. I was really confused, especially as I knew I checked my phone was charging before I went to sleep. Obviously, I was expecting that my phone battery was going to be dead as no power had gone to it. So I clicked a button to check and my phone was fully charged. I was baffled, but as the house was quite old, I wondered whether there was something a bit dodgy going on with the wiring and maybe the plug socket had somehow worked without the switch being on, like there was still electricity going through. But the thing is, the phone was still plugged in and was no longer charging, so it really didn't make any sense. And when I told my husband, he said something like, you know, you must have turned it off at some point and forgotten, but I knew that I hadn't. 
He's a very logical and rational person and he really didn't seem bothered about it. So it put my mind at ease and I thought, oh, I don't know what happened. I'm sure it's nothing, it doesn't matter. It's weird, but I'll let it go. We went down and had breakfast and said hello to the other people staying at the B&B and then we headed out to the local area to do a bit more exploring. On our second and final night in the B&B, we closed the heavy velvet curtains and went to bed. I triple checked that my phone was properly plugged in and the switch was turned on at the wall and everything seemed to be in order. This next part is all according to my husband, but I have no reason not to believe him as along with my stepdad, he would be the last person to make up a story like this. During the night, he was woken up by a clicking sound. At first he thought it was just something in the house or maybe even the dog sleeping downstairs because we could sort of hear it. We knew that the kitchen was below us and the dog was making some noises that we'd heard previously. So he just put it down to that. But the clicking didn't stop and it was this very regular noise. He opened his eyes and as his eyes adjusted to his surroundings, he noticed that the velvet curtains were slightly open and that the light from either the moon or the nearby church or a street lamp was streaming through the gap. He was pretty freaked out as the clicking sounded very close and he couldn't understand why the curtains were parted. I was fast asleep next to him and he was sort of prodding me and nudging me to try and wake me up to see what I made of the situation. According to him, I didn't fully wake up but my sleep was disturbed and I kind of flipped and turned over. And as I did, the clicking stopped. My husband closed his eyes for a moment as by this point he was completely frozen with fear. And when he opened them, the curtains were fully closed. No light was coming through them anymore. There was no window open or any kind of breeze. So there was no explanation as to why the curtains had moved. I have no idea how he got back to sleep that night, but in the morning I could tell that he was totally weirded out by what had happened. As soon as I woke up, he told me everything that had taken place. And my two biggest memories are one, him going over to the curtains to feel the weight of them and check that there was no open window or way they could have moved on their own. And two, me going over to the plug socket where my phone was plugged in and flicking the switch on and off. After he described this clicking, I'd put two and two together and I asked my husband whether that was the noise he had heard. And it was, it was that exact noise. I looked at my phone and this time it hadn't charged at all. The battery was almost dead. By this point, we were totally speechless and we went down for breakfast in this strange kind of daze. The lady whose house it was took our breakfast order and after we'd eaten, we were chatting a little and my husband blurts out, has anyone ever told you they think the house might be haunted? I was thinking, this is her home, don't put that thought in her mind. But although she said no one else had ever reported anything weird and she hadn't experienced anything strange in the house herself, the lady who had previously owned the home did pass away there. I really hope that she wasn't too alarmed by our question and we didn't elaborate, so perhaps she thought we were just asking because of the graveyard next door, but what I will say is that I didn't have any kind of negative feeling when I was in the room. There didn't seem to be a bad energy, and honestly, I'd have stayed another night if we'd been booked in. But that was the last night of our holiday and we went home with this little paranormal souvenir story that we told to our friends and family as soon as we saw them. So those are my two main paranormal experience stories. I really hope you found them interesting. I've definitely had other smaller encounters over the years, but I feel I've always been able to explain them away. There have always been alternative explanations for what has happened. For example, I once went on a Hindu or a bachelorette party, if you're across the pond, and it was definitely a unique one. We actually spent the night at Dudley Castle, which is in the West Midlands of England. And I think we were there until around 4 or 5 a.m. And it was an overnight ghost hunt. So we didn't sleep, we were in lots of different parts of the castle and the castle ruins, and there were all kinds of seances and Ouija boards going on. I didn't actually participate in them because I kind of believe in it too much to mess with it, but lots of people around me had very odd experiences. 
there wasn't any alcohol, so we were all totally sober. But by the end, we were also very, very tired. And even though at one point I thought I saw a couple of odd shadows or shapes, I think in reality I was just exhausted. It was actually very, very fun though. And even though some parts were really scary, I really enjoyed getting to know more about the history of the place because I'm a huge history geek. I also thought I saw a few strange things on the ghost walks I mentioned at the very start of this episode back in Conway, but being a kid and swept up in the experience, I couldn't really pinpoint exactly what. Perhaps it was more of a feeling. One very odd thing that happened to me that I couldn't describe as paranormal, but it was definitely very strange, happened back in 2018 when I was on holiday in Turkey with my sister. Very long story short, on the first night that we were in Turkey, I actually fell on a wet floor and broke my wrist, and the break was so bad that I had to have surgery whilst we were out there. The weird part came when we were still in the hospital, I'd had my surgery, and my sister and I were talking about some events that had happened earlier in the day on the day that I'd broken my wrist. There were some really strange signs of what was to come. For example, my sister had taken a photo of me in the pool at our hotel, and my arm was positioned in such a way that the reflection in the water looked like my wrist and my hand were separated from my arm. A few hours before I had my fall, we'd met this British lady and she was really friendly, really bubbly. We were having a really good laugh with her, a really good conversation. And at the end, she suddenly got very serious and said to us, girls, be careful. And we said, of course we will. Yeah, absolutely. And she repeated again, no, no, be careful. It's quite eerie to look back on. And then around 30 minutes before I broke my wrist, my sister, her friend and I had all gone into a shop. And whilst they were looking at some jewellery, I had spotted that there were two gorgeous dogs lying down in the shop and I got distracted and I was playing with them. One of the dogs in particular kept putting its paw onto my wrist. I actually thought it was so strange that I filmed it. The dog wouldn't let me go. Every time I tried to move, it would put its paw onto my wrist. Eventually we left the shop and then we walked down this very narrow street that once you reached the end of it, you had to decide whether you were going to turn left or right. There was nowhere else to go. We had to turn right in order to go to the place where we were due to meet the larger group that we were with. And as we tried to do so, there was another dog and it sort of blocked our pathway and it was barking at us and being really aggressive for absolutely no reason. In the town that we were staying in, there are lots of dogs everywhere, but they're usually very, very calm and they don't just bark at someone for no reason. It was really as though the dog was trying to block our path and stop us from going to our destination. There were definitely a few other very weird things that happened on that day that we've since looked back on. And all in all, I can say it was definitely one of the strangest days of my life. The two main paranormal experiences that I had, the one in Upton and then the one in North Wales with my husband, they were definitely enough for me on the supernatural front though. I would love to know which of those two stories you found weirdest. Well, at this point, I usually give a shout out to my research sources, but clearly this has been a mostly anecdotal episode. Although the lincolnshire.gov.uk website did help me with some of the historical information about Upton, and the site bcar.co.uk helped with some of the military history of the RAF Sturgate Airfield. If you've enjoyed this episode, you're going to want to check back on Halloween itself, Monday the 31st of October, because there will be a special bonus episode of Things Are About To Get Weird for you all to enjoy. Over on social media, I asked you whether any of you had had a strange or paranormal experience yourself, and lots of you sent in your stories, so a huge thank you. I've recorded a bonus episode where I've read out some of your emails, so do check back for that bonus ep on Monday. Monday. I have a tiny little favour to ask. If you are enjoying the podcast, I would massively appreciate a rating or review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. They mean the world to me and it only takes a second or two to click those stars. So if you do, please let me know so I can say an enormous thank you. As always, please do get in touch to let me know your thoughts on today's episode and I would love to hear about your own stories too, especially if you've had a paranormal experience, so please do let me know. If you're into Instagram, the handle is at thingsgetweirdpodcast 
And on Twitter, it's at about to get weird. You can also email me at thingsgetweirdpodcast at gmail.com. We also have the Facebook page and discussion group. So if you search things are about to get weird on Facebook, you'll find both of those. I have actually had quite a few messages asking about general bonus episodes, whether I might do some bonus episodes where I interview people or maybe read out other strange but true stories that have happened to you, my listeners. So I'd really love to know what you would enjoy to hear here for bonus episodes, so please do feel free to let me know. Until next time, take care of yourself and others and keep it weird, but the good kind of weird. <laughs>